All right, so talking with Ken and Sandra and working with Chris, we wanted to come up with some sort of curriculum or coursework or discussion points for helping companies understand one of the areas where we feel like there's big gaps in the entrepreneurial environment, which is how to take your idea and get it to market. Whether it's a technology idea, software, consumer product, lots of different opportunities out there. But there's a gap, lots of people when they're trying to start a company and they're experiencing getting things to market. I want to start off real quickly, I hate the whole sort of introductory thing, but I'd like people to go around real quick, say your name, your company, and give me a feel for what type of industry you're in, whether it's technology, software, consumer products. That way it helps me kind of steer what I'm doing and, and some of the messaging that I'll give through the talk, if you don't mind, we can start. Thanks everybody, appreciate that. I'll give you a, a brief background on myself for those who don't know me. As Chris indicated, I'm currently president of a consulting firm, the Medita Company, also co-founder and director of Brown Sparrow Marketing, which is a consumer products launching uh, holding company. I've spent the last 21 years essentially in an entrepreneurial environment. My first entrepreneurial experience was with a I started a company out of one of my manager's basement when I was 19 in college. I didn't even know what a startup was. I didn't realize how creepy it was going to his grandfather's basement every day and working out of there. Just did it because it seemed like something fun to do. And we grew that into a small financial services firm that's now uh, one of the 50 best companies to work for in West Michigan and one of the 50 fastest growing broker dealers in the country, a company called Regal Financial Group. So I spent the first seven years of my career really, I heard some service-based people out there in the services industry. I wasn't selling hard technology products, hard consumer products, it was a service base. The next 17 years, I spent more on the product side, everything from women's underwear to software and lots of things in between. Almost always from a startup early stage or turnaround type situation where we were doing one of three things trying to go to market. Take a new product and get it to new customers. Take a new product and introduce it to some of your old customers or take an old product and get it to market with a new set of customers. All those things apply across the board, whether it was a startup or a, sort of an existing company. What I can say, you know, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I've been where you're at. Most of you, no matter where you're at in the life cycle, I've been in, I've been in your shoes. So I can sympathize and really see from your position some of the challenges that you run into. And that's why we wanted to talk about go-to-market because we find that and getting to that first customer, right? Getting that first customer acquisition and getting that customer base built is an opportunity to really help you succeed and exceed your expectations. All right, so I talk with a lot of companies. Um, not as many as some of the folks in here. I'm sure Chris and Ken and Sandra have talked to tens of thousands, but I've talked to hundreds and into the thousands of different companies, startups, existing companies. And there's lots of things you can't control, especially when you're an entrepreneur, it's when you're in your early stage, right? You can't control the economy. You can't control what's going on out there in the capital markets. You can't control the weather. Lots of things you can't control. But there is one thing you can control, and that's whether you have a plan. And that's why I love this phrase and then frankly fail to plan you're planning to fail because if you go at your business shooting from the hip and trying to take your product to market just all on sense of feel and I think this and I hope that you're setting yourself up to not meet the success that you want to anybody everybody seen this movie feel the dreams yeah. anybody, any, anybody remember the line when you stand in the cornfield what's he hear does anybody, anybody remember that? Anyone want to shout it out for me? If you build it, they will, build it, they will come. come. That reminds me of, uh, you know, build a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door. That type of thing. cliche, it's lies. <laughs> so it's all lies. Just because you build a great product does not mean that everybody's going to find you. You can have the best mousetrap out there, but unless you have a strategy for getting that mousetrap in front of your customers and in front of the people who can influence your customers, Odds are decent, you're gonna be standing there with your mouth strapped saying what this guy's saying. Where is everybody, right? Where is everybody? Because people don't know just because you've got a great idea. You've gotta have a strategy to get it in front of them. This is from the original Twilight Zone episode, by the way, scary stuff. <laughs> so I'm gonna share with you today three components of a go-to-market strategy. There's three pieces in this that we do with companies that we work with, that we've identified that help companies become more effective at getting their product to market. First one we're gonna talk about today is a market analysis. And this is where we talk about getting data. Not just asking your neighbor or asking your wife, 
we're talking about independent and objective data, not opinions. And this is work that you need to do to be more successful in getting the market. So you look at big markets out there, right? You've got a product, Jim, you've got Organibus, and you've got all these different industries where you can see where it can be useful, right? It's a big world out there. And when I talk about markets, I'm really talking about industries as a way that I'm framing it. You've got a standard all over. The key is finding the focus, right? Focusing and identifying those key markets and hitting them dead center because that's where the money is. The money's not all over the place. Right? I mean, you can make money all over the place, but you want to do it efficiently and effectively. You've got to find the focused markets where you're going to get the path of least resistance and be able to find those early successes. So you've got to evaluate those key markets. When I talk about evaluation, you've got to understand these industries. What are the signs of these industries? Right? What are their growth patterns over the last five years? Are they trending up or are they trending down? Because if you've got to choose between a couple of markets, you might as well choose one that's trending up versus one that's on the decline. What's the overall size of those markets? Who are the main players in those markets? These are the, this is the sort of data that you want to get together and study as you're looking at markets to launch your product or service within. Okay. Once you figure out the markets, then you've got to figure out the channels within those markets. Right? Every market has different verticals, different silos within it that you can target to bring your products to. So, for example, if you're a technology product, okay. Maybe you want to go after manufacturers. Maybe your technology lends itself to manufacturers. Maybe to government, military, and defense. Maybe to institutional or educational. Maybe to medical. Right? Here's what you know, is that you've got to build that into the different silos, understand those markets you know, in software. Are you going to deliver this product to your customer through the cloud? That can be for B2C or B2B. For B2B, it could be through a server, right, enterprise. Download, mobile apps, in a box. How are you going to reach the customers? Once you identify that industry, how are you going to get to them? What channels are you going to use? Like consumer products. There we go. The consumer products of the world can be even bigger, right? Online, on television, catalog. You've got consumer events, direct selling, which is like home parties and network marketing. In retail, there's even verticals within the vertical of retail, right? You've got food, drug, and mass natural stores, gift stores, uh, you know, you've got uh, department stores, footwear stores, it goes on and on. You need to figure out those industries, and figure out the target channel within those industries that lend your product or service your best chance to get in front of customers and be successful. All right. The next thing you want to do is take a look at the competition. Most people have probably heard there's direct and indirect competition, right? So direct competition, you're running a race, and your competition are the other runners. They look like you, they're doing the same things you are. Indirect competition, you have to identify that as well. You have to see where else could your customers be spending their dollars. So a cat and a dog, right? A cat is not a dog and vice versa. They're not direct competitors, but they're both pets. Right? They're both indirectly competition as pets. Let me give you a real world, world example. I've worked in the past with a, uh, with a software company called Onu One. They build a software that basically you can take, if you're a product-based business, you can take this, give the 3D drawings of them, load it up online so that you've got a 3D catalog. They've got hot buttons in there. You can load all your content up. You can get it on an app so your salespeople go in. And if you've got a million of these, they can't bring in a million samples. So it gives you all the 3D breaks down details, all these different things. Their direct competition are other 3D catalog programs, SaaS models. Their indirect competition is a paper cap, right? Because when a marketing person is looking to go to market, whether they're going with an online solution or a traditional solution, both those dollars are in competition for the same spend. So when you're thinking about your product, don't just think about, well, there's nobody else out there that has the same flugel valve that I have, right? Think about what other things are indirectly competing for those dollars. Have an awareness of that so that you understand what the market will bear from a standpoint of pricing competition and other things. During the market analysis phase, another important piece that we do, it's important to understand who are the influences in your industries, right, in your markets, in those channels. When I talk about influencers, I'm talking about a lot of different things. Okay? I may be talking about media, so trade magazines. I may be talking about regular national publications. You may have editors or writers. 
that are experts on your topic, uh, potentially radio and print, or um, excuse me, radio and TV in addition to print. There's also social influencers. This is a great piece that uh, Technocrati put together that 31%, so this is for consumer products, the third leading influencer for consumer purchases are bloggers. Something that barely existed you know, in, to the general public five, 10 years ago, things that most people weren't even aware of is now the third leading influencer. So bloggers can be influencers. There's also social media specific influencers. There's a company out there, it's called Tracker, T-R-A-C-K-R. And this company, what it does online is it tracks <coughs> within certain industries who are the people on Twitter talking about automobiles, if that's your vertical, right? And so they find these influencers within uh, different social media outlets to try and link you up with them because if you can get these influencers identified, when you get into the execution phase of your go-to-market strategy, you want to be talking with these people. So you want to identify them up front, understand who they are, who the key players are, and their contact information because right now you're building the background data to build your plan <coughs> This is an important piece. I guess I'd argue most of all of them are important pieces, but in, interview your customers. And I don't just mean, and believe me, I've made this mistake, well, my wife loved it. My mom thinks they're great. Right? You've got to talk to people that aren't afraid to tell you what they really think. You've got to talk to people that are independent. Most importantly, you have to talk to people who at the end of the day are going to have to write a check, or give you a credit card, or write you a purchase order for your idea. Whether it's a service, whether it's a, you know, a consumer product, technology product, no matter what it is, you have to get in touch with these people. And it is not always easy, but it's key. You have to talk to people. If they're consumers, you have to talk to consumers. If it has to go through a retail outlet, then you need to talk to the retailer because they're the gatekeeper to that customer. If you're selling to a manufacturer, you need to talk to manufacturers. You have to get in there and spend some time and talk to them because you need to understand what their pain points are. How in the world can we know if a product is meeting their needs, if we haven't talked to them to discover their needs before we come out on the market with it. How are you going to know how to sell them down the road if you haven't identified their hot button? So this is an opportunity to sit down, talk with manufacturers, talk with customers. Sometimes it takes some good le legwork on it, right? You have to get introductions to the right people because maybe you don't know the right people, but it's important because you're setting yourself up for success by understanding what the decision makers for your product are thinking and what their opinions are, <clears throat> excuse me, what matters. Define your customer value proposition. So once you know what the customer thinks and what they want, and more importantly, what they need, you can define their CVP. And the best way to sum that up is basically, why should they buy this solution from you right now? It's that simple. Why buy this from you right now? When you can answer that, you figured out what your value is to the customer. Everybody seen the prices, right? right. Bob, Bob Barker, I guess it's Drew Carey now, but I like Bob Barker better. Right? So, so come on down. That's the whole premise of this. They're guessing the price, right? They sit there and they say, I think they put something on stage. I think this is worth X, 425, 500, whoever's closest gets up on stage and so on. You need to do the same thing when you're doing your market analysis. Evaluate pricing. These people make these decisions based on their perceived value for whatever's sitting up on stage, based on their, what, what they do as a consumer, and what they see on TV and things like that. You need to know when you go to market what the perceived value is for your product based on the competition, based on the indirect competition. Well, is somebody willing to spend $1,000 for my widget if they you know, are normally used to paying $100 for the indirect competition for it, you need to think these things through for your services all the way throughout. Once you figure out what that pricing is, then you've gotta be able to take it and work it back and say, okay, well, if the price for my service is $1,000 for a one month service, can I be profitable at that? You've gotta use that number and then work back to the margin analysis because if you start from the bottom and work up, you might come up with a, with a price that will never fly in the market. So you need to understand the marketplace before you, before you set your pricing model. But you have to understand what the market's doing so you can set that pricing model on the back. All right, so we talked about there being three components, right, to go to market strategy. First one was get the data, market analysis. The next one is plan. So build your plan. That's the go to market strategy, or G2M. 
So going to market is your roadmap. All right, you need to get a roadmap to the customer. What you're doing, remember we talked about the big bullseye, the big picture out there, industries and markets, right? Channels within those. Each channel, no matter what industry you're in, no matter what channel you're in, has their own distribution model within it, right? Their own way that those products get to market. These are just some examples, right? Sometimes people get there through distributors, they get there through independent, independent manufacturers reps, they get there through sales staff. Software can get there through resellers. You know, there's direct selling directly in. There's all kinds of different ways of doing it. At this point, you've got to, once you've got all the data, you've got to figure out in each channel, what's the conduit to get to the customers? Because that's going to affect how you set up your whole business. If you've got to go through a distributor, you've got to have some different margins in there than if you're just selling direct to the customer, right? Or just direct to the manufacturer. You have to understand these pieces. You need to understand how they make decisions and what's competitively acceptable for them and what's, what the market looks like for that. Otherwise, you're going to go in there and just unprepared. And you can prepare for all of this ahead of time. It just takes research and some work. A good example of this would be, you know, somebody wants to go, you go down to the Mid-Michigan Medical Center, right? I've got the best new heart monitor there is. I walk in, hi, I'm Tom Sesti, I've got a new heart monitor. Who do you point me to? Can I sell that to you? You know, they're gonna laugh me out. Even if there's somebody in that building who's responsible for buying that, guess what? They don't let Tom Sesti off the street come in and sell that person. They go through a distributor like a Cardinal Health or they go through normal channels. So understand those channels to set yourself up to be effective and successful. The next thing you wanna do during this planning phase is understand the key events where your targets come together, right? So expos, you know, every, every industry's got them. Expos, conventions, conferences, seminars, um, you know, workshops, all kinds of different learning experiences. You want to do two things. One, you wanna identify them because that's where your customers are gonna be. Okay, <clears throat> so you want to identify them, get them on a calendar, calendar them out, build in the budget so you can understand how it would affect your proposed cash flow so you can see if you can afford to be at those shows. I would say before you do that, the most important thing you can do is try to walk those shows. Try and go and learn everything you can. You can learn so much about an industry by going to a trade show, asking questions, walking it. But more importantly, remember the slide we showed before where, you know, where is everybody? If you just go to a show and you don't prepare for it, you don't know anything about it, you just pop up a booth, you know, unless you happen to get exceptionally lucky and you know, Kim Kardashian slips on a banana peel in front of your booth or something like that, nobody's going to know you're there. You haven't had time to prepare. So you're, you want to prepare ahead of time, understand how they sell. Some shows are very different in how they interact. Some it's very easy for the buyers to have access to you. Sometimes it's just middlemen at that show. And if you've ever been to a trade show, it's, it's like going to Art Van Furniture, right? You go into Art Van and everybody goes with their head down because I don't want anybody to sell me, so I'm going straight to the couches, right? Same thing at a trade show. I've got an appointment with my big supplier and I'm going straight to that. And please don't try and jump out and sell me in the aisle even though I can see you trying to read my badge. So you gotta prepare ahead of, uh, ahead of time and understand the landscape at that show. But these sorts of events can be great ways to learn about the industry and to then market to the industry and sell to the industry once you've got your head around. All right. During this phase, the go-to-market, it's very important then that you dig in and you identify the sales tools and the marketing tools that you're going to need to be able to be out there selling and marketing to these potential customers. And there's lots of tools, right? There's websites. Now, a website anymore is a given. You have to have one. But what type of website do you need? Does it have to be transactional based? Is it more of a brochure? Is it going to be demonstrative? Is there going to be video showing people how your service works or how it integrates into their technology? So that's one piece. But, you know, identify those tools. Do you need brochures or demo videos, displays, leaflets, presentations, order forms, agreements? Right now you're just trying to understand based on the, the industry standards, what are the tools you need to be able to launch your product to market? Okay. You also want to define program structure. So if you're going into... Um, any particular market, I guarantee you there's a benchmark. What do they normally expect for commission for sales reps? What are the sort of distributor market support funds that they expect? You want to identify and build these structures out 
So that way, when you're ready to execute and launch, you're not caught sort of like, oh, I didn't know that was gonna happen. These are things that you can research by asking. And, and I mean, you'd be amazed at how much you can find on the internet, or there's people out there that'll do it for you. But you need to have this information to be able to get the market more successful. <coughs> One of, the, one of the things we do at the tail end is we start to define what are the channel management concepts, or excuse me, activities that you have to have to manage any given sales channel. So you may have a distributor channel, you may have a direct sales where I'm going out and doing all the sales, you may have a reseller channel. You've got to have strategies and tools in place to manage each of those channels. And you know, Typically as an entrepreneur you're managing them all, you know, or whoever's responsible for sales within your organization is managing them, but you need to know how those are because you can't talk to the end customer the same as you talk to the distributor. It's two different frames of mind, two different perspectives you're coming from. So when we look at channel management, I like to think of it in two big buckets. Hunting is the first one, all right? To me, hunting is about three things. You're either prospecting, you're presenting, or you're closing, all right? You're prospecting until you have a chance to make a presentation and you're presenting until you close. Rinse and repeat, you know, all across the board. And so prospecting is really about identifying who's a potential customer, qualifying them, do they fit, and then engaging them. On the outbound side that you're engaging them through telemarketing, email, you know, knocking on their door, all the traditional methods and more. Inbound would be you know, generated by marketing and advertising. Right? So on your website, you've got SEO and SEM driving them in. If maybe you're uh, hiring companies that are going to go out, put, work, put the word out there for you through a marketing campaign. Maybe it's a print advertising campaign. That's going to drive people into you. And so what stage you're at okay, is going to define what you do next in the prospecting world, in the hunting world. So you can build at this point in time templates, right? What does my introductory phone call look like? What's my introductory email look like? You build those out. If somebody doesn't call me back within a week, are you sending them another call? Are you sending them another email? You build out this program. Whether, you know, you, where you're at in the stage will determine what you're doing from an activity standpoint. And this is all a part of your go-to-market plan. You can think this through all ahead of time versus just trying to do it by the seat of your pants and then scrambling one day when you go, oh my gosh, I have no sales and it's the 29th of the month, what am I gonna do? The other piece of it, oh, I'm sorry, we'll go back real quick. The last piece, the uh, next piece is presentation, excuse me. So presentation can be live, right? You're having to sit down with somebody, you're doing a webinar, you're doing a teleconference. It can also be uh, an indirect. So a direct would be live, indirect would be, you've got a pre-recorded video on your website that talks about your product, shows how it works, things like that. That's an indirect presentation. Those are sometimes useful pieces <coughs> to try and capture people's interest and drive them into you. And then obviously you're closing. Closing is going to be different depending on your industry, right? If you're a software company, it's going to be, you know, they, they uh, check off the subscription box, box, if it's a SaaS model, they make their payment. If you're a consumer products company, you got a purchase order. If you're a technology company selling to a manufacturer, you've got a purchase order. We love to say that you close once you get paid, but a lot of purchase order situations, you don't have the benefit of getting paid up front. Mm -hmm. So typically you don't have your salespeople chasing the payment. All right, now we'll talk about farming. So prospect, or hunting's all about bringing them in. Farming's all about keeping them and growing them, okay? So from that standpoint, you know, the initial, the very first training, the initial ramp up, that's what you're doing when they first come in. You've got your farmers typically working with them, making sure they're on board, making sure they're happy, help, they help, hopefully they understand what's going on, getting them on board your program. You gotta have a communication plan for these customers. Not just a welcome message, but how am I going to touch base with them on a regular basis to understand how they're doing, what their needs are. I promise you, if you sell somebody something, you bring them on board and that's the last time you communicate to them without them bothering you, it's not going to be the longest relationship you've ever had. You've got to have a plan for how you're going to consistently reach out to them, and touch base with them, and continue the touch points with them. Maintenance. Whether that's account maintenance, whether you've got a service-oriented item, right? What's your plan for service? If you've got software, what's your plan for updates? And what's your plan for uh, maintenance from the standpoint of when there's a problem? What do you do? What, how does the customer interact with you? What's your plan to funnel them through your company, whether it's one person or 50 people? Then there's you know, ongoing training opportunities. 
with, and, and you can, don't have to think just about the customer with this. Think about your sales, your sales distribution model as well. So whether it's a sales force, whether it's distributors, you've got opportunities for training ongoing with customers and with sales channels. You've got opportunities for you know, account planning you know, so you can understand what's going on out there in the market with your folks. You've got opportunities for conferences. Lots of people bring their salespeople in or they bring their customers in. You see that in a lot of software companies, right, where they have these, you know, it's the Salesforce, you know, we, I use Salesforce. I'm already seeing the logo for their 2015 conference with a little girl fishing it looks like. And they're, you know, they're trying to get all their users to come to the conference so they can disseminate content, get you pumped up, and keep you as a customer. That's part of maintenance and farming and growing. And then what kind of resources are you going to make available? So are you going to make market, uh, you know, marketing dollars available to people who use your product? Are you going to make somebody on site? Is that a necessary part of your service, to have somebody on site for them? So that farming piece is all about what happens after that initial sale, how you keep that customer and you try and expand with that customer, keep them happy and make them even happier. We're going to last piece. So we talked about three components. Number one, market analysis, get data. Number two, go to market. So you're building out the plan. Number three is where you execute the plan. Call this the first sale, right? Your customer acquisition plan. Got the information, got your plan mapped out, now what? You gotta take that plan, you gotta put it into action. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Dave Ramsey. He's on about 500 radio stations across the country. He tends to be a more of a money uh, financial expert and really about getting out of debt. But I love this quote from him. We're all in the business of sales. It talks about how teachers sell students, parents sell their kids, and traditional salespeople sell. And he's right. Okay, the whole point of being in business is, is to sell something. No matter what your business is, at the end of the day, somebody within your organization is trying to sell something. That's how you get revenue. And even if you've got a strong social aspect, there's still a portion of it that has to do with selling somebody. All right, anybody seen Jerry McGuire remember this scene? He's on the phone with Cuba Gooding Jr. and he's trying to get off the phone and all his clients are leaving him. Everybody, what's he say? Show me the money. Show me the money. Right. Sales is the most important thing you can be doing. Show me the money. Why? Sales solves a lot of problems for you, doesn't it? Solves cash flow problems. You're trying to attract investors. You think they're more attracted to a company that has sales or less attracted to a company that has sales. Sales will solve a lot of problems. So don't ever forget that revenue generation has to be your responsibility on a daily basis when you're executing this plan. Okay, so we've got, remember we talked about all the industries and divided it in and you've got your channels, you've got your distribution models. Now you've got within that distribution model, you say, okay, I'm going to take my software and I'm gonna go through a reseller market to try and reach the end users. Okay, there's a lot of resellers out there, right? So you've gotta build a list. Don't just come into work every day and be like, okay, I'm gonna spend three hours trying to research potential resellers and now I'm gonna try and sell them later. You've got the opportunity to build out a list. And there's a reason that the assembly line works, right? You can do something very efficiently and then you move on to the next step. Prioritize. Get all those customers, and potential customers, and distributors, whatever you're targeting within that channel, prioritize, narrow it down so that you can go after them and hit them hard. In a lot of companies, that I've worked with, we usually have a priority market, a priority target, and then we'll have a secondary and a tertiary just so we've got backups. If something gets slow, sometimes you can drift over there. And we try and make sure we've got at least 50, 50 potential customers or distributors or resellers, whoever we're trying to approach. And if we're in a channel where we've got both, then we put 50 of both so we can hit it hard with our action plan versus having to stop every time after we make the first call and go, okay, now who am I gonna call next? So you've gotta do the research, understand your market. Again, there's, there's, there's lots of ways to learn that ahead of time. You wanna be able to contact them right, you know, easily. I remember in the last section, we talked about all these different tools we needed to identify. Contracts, and marketing materials, and sales agreements, and commission programs. All right, well now you gotta prioritize them and get them done and turn them into deliverables. And, that's not always a 
short list. I mean, I, the last couple companies I've worked with, it's been over 100 different deliverables that they're trying to get before they can, you know, as they're moving to market. But that sounds more intimidating than it is. One deliverable might be as simple as establish a business Twitter account, right? Another one might be build a social media marketing plan. That's a little bit bigger. So you've got to get those deliverables together. You have to get them prioritized. And you know, there's lots of things that fall into this bucket, right? So sales agreements, and not just sales agreements for your customer, but for if there's a distributor, if you've got reps, these are pieces of those tools. Prospect list we talked about, sales tools, call script, email script. You went back in the first stage, you interviewed those customers. Now use that information to build out your call script and build out your email script so you can get to those people with a meaningful message, okay? Identify the training needs, social, all these different things. This is where you build it out, is in that third phase. So first phase, you're getting educated. Second one, you're building the plan. Now you're executing that. We also recommend companies put together a brief brand presentation. I'm talking four slides, you know, something very simple. Because you've got to be able to communicate to people who you are. You know, most of us in this room, you know, our companies are not, we're not IBM. You know, not Coke. People don't know who we are. They don't know what we stand for. So when you're in front of a prospective customer, you want to be able to make it clear to them quickly who you are, what you stand for. Not just customers, though. When you're trying to bring salespeople on, when you're trying to get distributors to bring on your product, you'd be amazed. No matter how great your product is, that distributor has about a million products that everybody else thought they were great, too. And some of them are moving, and some of them aren't. Some of them sell, and some of them don't. So you've got to help them understand why they should give any of their mental space to you. So. Your brand presentation can help you overcome that. This piece, I think, is the most important thing that we'll talk about today from a, sta from a sales standpoint. You have to have somebody within your organization who owns sales every day. It, it, you cannot not have that person. Now, I've worked for lots of companies. That you, I, I'm more sales focused than I am, for example, creative focused. If you ask me to design a brochure, it'd look awful. I can tell you what I like when I see one. I can tell you what colors I like. If you ask me to come up with those pieces, that's a part of my weakness. So lots of people who start businesses aren't necessarily strong salespeople. No harm in that. It's only harmful if you don't recognize it. And either get the skills you need, or get the team member that you need, because somebody has to own sales every day. If somebody isn't generate, working on revenue generation every single day, if it's this thing by committee where you come in and you bat it around and then at the end of the week somebody's making a few calls here and there, you're stuck. So the most important thing you can do is no excuses. Somebody has to be accountable for sales and they have to have the authority to do what needs to be done from a sales standpoint. They need to know what their parameters are and they've got to tear loose on it. And if you're a one-man band, which happens all the time, then you got to figure out how to get those skills or bring them in. Whether it's with cash, whether it's with equity, whatever it is, you've got to work to get that sales person in place. In most cases, it's going to be you. Now, the next thing you want to develop is understand your sales force plan. So from the standpoint of you know, again, small companies, usually it's a sales force of one. You don't usually have the luxury of saying, oh, I'm going to hire five salespeople. But you need to understand what the trajectory is for that, right? I can handle sales until this point in time. Or in the channel where there are resellers. Okay, well, our plan is to have X number of resellers by this point in time. Our plan is to have so many reps in which territory, in which piece of time. And the person we talked about on the last slide who owns sales has to own this piece too. They've got to have that Salesforce plan in place. They've got to be able to reach out and not just try and reach out to customers, but manage the salespeople. If you bring a salesperson on and you call them once a month, how's it going? Why no sales last month? Oh, you know, it's just hard out there, blah, blah, blah. And then a month from then you're calling them again, you both fail. You've got the wrong person and you're not managing the right way. So you've got to have a plan for your Salesforce, whether it's internal, whether it's external, it's got to be owned by that same person who's owning sales. The last piece that we talk about is measuring outcomes. Okay, so when you're setting your plan in place, you've got to get your KPIs in place, your key performance indicators. Of course, the most important one is probably sales, profitability, right? But there's lots of different things depending on the industry you're in. If you're in a, a web-based industry, then it might be you know cost per acquisition or a cost per click. 
you may have situations where it's the number of leads generated out of this event. Whatever they are, you've got to set them up up front. Because how can you measure if you've been successful if you don't have any KPIs or measurements in place? If you can't measure it, you're gonna have no idea where you're at. So we talked about three pieces, right? Get the data, market analysis, build the plan, go to market, execute the plan, put your sales strategy in place, the first sale. Those are the three phases from a go-to-market strategy standpoint. If anybody has any questions, be happy to answer them. One point you mentioned that SOE, what does that stand well, I, 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 SEO probably, sales engine optimization. Oh, okay, SEO. Or SEM, search engine marketing. One of those two. Thank you. No problem. Anybody have any other questions? Where did Vendita come from? It's Italian for sales. <laughs> <laughs> Had to name it something. <clears throat> All right, questions? Very well put together. Thank, thank you. you. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Turn it over to Steve. Yeah. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Do you have this in a handout or something where you I've got slides? Or? I've got an outline. Yeah, that I can. Okay. Is, uh, oh, well. Are you? Can we get that down? Yep. Because I talk to many, you know, companies that really need to be small. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, please bear with me. I'm getting over a cold. Actually, yesterday I had no voice, so I'm very <laughs> fortunate that it came back in time for this hey. presentation. <laughs> um, but I'm fairly confident there's probably a lot of frequencies that I'll squeak or something along those lines. So, um, My name is Steve Schwartz. I'm the managing member of Alpha Django. Um, at Alpha Django, we are the CTO, uh, basically the acting CTO and development team for early stage software startups. Um, so I'm kind of the CTO in residence. I'm acting CTO for a lot of different startups. Um, so. Um, Real quick, I'll just preface this by saying um, this is a more general presentation that I usually give to entrepreneurs who are trying to build companies. Um, it's less well put together. Uh, it's a hodgepodge of lessons learned from all the different companies and startups that I've worked on. Um, I'll give them a bit more of a go-to-market strategy slant as I'm explaining them, um, but there's a lot of different things that this presentation talks about. Um, when I build companies, I'm usually at the very early stages. I'm one of the founding members. It's you know, two or three people maybe that are just starting the company from idea and building out from there. So when you're working with earlier stage companies, um, or at least when I'm working with earlier stage companies, I tend to have uh, a more sort of holistic vision of how to build a company and how to make it successful. Um, there's a lot of ways in our society, in our economy, to build successful companies and make a lot of money without doing these things. Um, but the way that I kind of look at companies is there's really only two things you need to do to build a successful company and grow it. You need to create value and you need to realize that value. You can't have one without the other. Technically you can, but again, like I said, I don't like building companies that way. So that means you have to actually create some sort of value for someone. Um, I'm usually on the technical side being the acting CTO, so I'm the guy who likes building things. Um, I have a lot of friends who also are on the technical side, they love building things, uh, but then they can't sell it, they can't market it, they don't think about those things. I, have, I know so many people who build so many cool things that no one will ever find out about uh, because they don't get the realizing value piece. Um, so you can't just create value, you have to somehow realize the value that you've created. Um, you also can't just realize value. I know a lot of people who do that as well. Um, there's lots of ways to sell things that aren't that valuable. Um, and I, I uh, work with a lot of founders and startups. Obviously, I'm the technical piece. They're usually the non-technical piece. The best startups that I've helped build are the ones where the other founder is a really good salesperson. And when I say good salesperson, I don't mean someone who can sell ice to an Eskimo. I'm not interested in selling ice to an Eskimo. It's probably not very valuable to them given their environment. I'm talking about the person who actually is good at talking to people, understanding what they actually need, not trying to sell them something that they don't need, um, but finding the people who do need it. I'm talking about the person who wouldn't try to sell ice to an Eskimo. They would go find someone else who's not an Eskimo. 
if they have ice to sell. Um, so knowing that that's kind of the holistic way that I, I tend to look at companies, I'm going to talk about things in this presentation that aren't necessarily going to market or sales, but I see them as all related and interconnected. As a CTO, I tend to go out and do a lot of uh, early sales and, and customer development because as the person building the product, I want to make sure that I'm building the right thing. Um, so I'll start real quick. Who am I? I'm Steve Schwartz. Uh, I'm a coach at New Enterprise Forum based out of Ann Arbor, where we, uh, and I'm also on the board of directors. Um, we help uh, new founders and entrepreneurs uh, develop and craft their pitch for investors if they're building a fundable company. Um, I'm a coach, speaker, and judge at several startup weekends, um, which is an event where people get together on a Friday evening, they come up with an idea, and by Sunday they actually have the first version of that product built and ready to go. Um, I'm also an instructor at Grand Circus out of Detroit where I do some workshops on building what we call the minimum viable product for early stage startups and uh, teaching some workshops on software development as well. Um, I founded and co-founded several startups, including uh, RateMyStudentRental.com, which was a website where students could go and rate and review their student rental housing. And we actually sold a private label version of it to colleges and universities. Um, Conference Juice, which is a website for attendees to network at conferences. Um, and Car Code SMS, which is the most recent here, it's software for car dealerships, which allows car dealerships to receive and respond to text messages from customers. So we uh, automatically provision them a local phone number that can receive text messages, reroute those text messages to the salespeople at the dealership, and then we help monitor and track those conversations for the dealership integrating with their CRM and whatnot. Um, and Car Code SMS actually was just acquired by Edmunds.com in October. Thank you. Um, so real quick, uh, to really understand this presentation, I'm going to go through a lot of really random lessons with a lot of different companies, so you can kind of understand where those lessons are coming from. I'll quickly take you through, uh, uh, I'll take you through a quick bullet point uh, list of kind of where I came from, what I did. Um, I started out as a mechanical and electrical engineer um, in school in the automotive field. Uh, when I was a freshman, I started a used car parts company just because I went to Kettering University and it's about 85% male. So there wasn't much to do on the weekends, so I decided to start a company and see how that goes. Um, as part of that uh, used car parts company, I figured out how to build the website and the search engine behind it that cataloged all the car parts that I was selling and, and allowed you to um, search for those. So I learned to develop software as a means to an end. I actually ended up kind of falling in love with software development. It was really enjoyable. So throughout the, the years I was at college getting my mechanical electrical engineering degrees, I was also going to class during the day and then going home at night and teaching myself software development. Um, I started a, my first startup, which was RateMyStudentRental.com when I was a junior in school. Um, then I graduated. Uh, as soon as I graduated, in order to help sustain myself and my partners, um, while Rate My Student Rental still wasn't profitable yet, I started a software consulting company, and, uh, which allowed me to quit my job and have a more flexible schedule to work on my startup. Uh, I started another startup, which I'll talk about in a few slides, called Leap Nuke, which came out of Rate My Student Rental. Um, and then I almost got funding for Lead Nuke, but ended up shutting it down again. I'll get to, instead of taking the funding, and again, I'll talk about uh, why I did that in a, a future slide here. Um, I built a lot of open source software. If you don't know what that is, it's when a software developer or a team builds some sort of software, and then instead of trying to commercialize it or um, turn it into a product, they just release the source code to the world and let anyone use it for pretty much whatever they want for free. Why do we do that? Not quite sure, it's kind of fun, that's why I did it. Um, and then uh, with Alpha Django, actually, so the comp software company I started when I graduated was called Alpha Django. We were a software consultancy. In 2012, uh, I pivoted Alpha Django. Instead of being a general purpose software consultancy, uh, we changed to building startups full time. That's when we came up with the idea of what if we were just acting CTO and development team for early stage startups. Uh, and so through that, I've built a lot more startups. Um, these are some of the startups that we've built. Um, there's a lot here. Uh, it's not really important, I guess, to know what they all are. I'll talk about a few of them that have more interesting stories in these slides. Um, also, uh, we've worked with startups at U of M, Y Combinator, Carnegie Mellon, Ann Arbor Spark, and Wisdom uh, out of Detroit are uh, some of the incubators and accelerators that we've worked with. Um, We've also worked with startups all across the board. There's bootstrap startups that grow into really uh, nice lifestyle businesses. 
um, where the founder basically gets to keep total control and decide what they want to do with the startup throughout its life. Uh, there's bootstrap startups that grow really big. There's bootstrap startups that don't grow very big, but that's fine. There's funded startups that grow really big or you know, funded startups that don't really grow at all. They're all over the place. Um, in fact, the straight lines are probably oversimplifications of what happens with a company when you build it. This is probably more accurate, though for my slide, I like to pretend that it's like one out of 10, and then I can just tell people, don't worry about that. <laughs> um, so some random lessons that I've learned. One is talk about your startup all the time with everyone, or, and again, these are all kind of geared towards startups. Uh, I think a lot of them apply to, to all businesses, especially if you happen to agree with me on the whole create value, realize value thing. Um, forget the NDA, be open about what you're doing, seek feedback and advice. Um, the reason that I, I say these things is because um, a lot of times when I talk to founders or people building companies, there's a lot of fear that if they tell everyone about what their company does exactly, someone's going to steal their idea, they're going to take it and run, they're going to beat them to the punch. Um, it's, it's pretty much all BS from what I've seen. Not many people are going to steal your idea because not many people are going to ever be as passionate about your idea as you are. Why? Because they didn't have the idea. So um, as much as you think someone's going to steal your idea, everyone else sees it as just that, your idea, not theirs. So people don't tend to steal your ideas. And I think even if there is the risk of someone taking your idea, the actual benefit of talking about your idea with a lot of people all the time, it facilitates a lot of connections and a lot of luck that wouldn't happen otherwise. Um, so one example of this is actually when we were, uh, CarCode SMS is a second product we built with a founder that we had built a previous product for called CarCode.me. We were really creative with the, the naming in our products. Um, but when we built CarCode.me, it was software that basically integrated with car dealerships inventory management software and created a mobile website for their inventory that was always up to date. It synced once a day. And so their inventory on their mobile site was always up to date with what was on their lot, had all the information there. Um, and then we put QR codes on the window stickers of the car so you could actually scan the window sticker with your phone and get all the information about that car that wasn't on the sticker. Um, when we initially started building it, we thought we had to build the whole thing. We were sitting there planning, okay, we gotta build this part that integrates with inventory, we gotta build the part that does the mobile uh, website, we gotta build the part that can actually print window stickers for dealerships where are the window sticker suppliers? Let's find that out and figure all that out. But we talked to a lot of people as we were planning all this out and actually word got out because we were talking to so many people, word got out um, to a uh, window sticker printer. Like it wasn't even us that met them. Someone told someone else who told him. So while we're sitting here, we had already started building the software and we just randomly get a call one day from one of the largest window sticker printers saying, hey, I heard you're building the software that creates an automatic mobile website and it's gonna put QR codes on the stickers. Here's the thing, I can already put QR codes on all my stickers. My problem is I got nowhere to point them. Someone scans a QR code, what am I gonna show them? I don't have like a mobile optimized website or anything. Can we just integrate? So we were actually, for our version one, we were able to one, cut out half of our development timeline, and two, we got 100 dealers signed up right when we launched because they were his pilot dealers that he's like, let's just try it out with these 100 first. So, like I said, talk to everyone about your idea because I think the benefits far outweigh the risk, and no one's going to steal your idea. Um, I say that with a caveat, no one's going to steal your idea unless they do. <laughs> I can't tell the future, I'm just human. <laughs> Maybe they will steal your idea. If they do, please don't come back to me. Be like, I trust you. Um, work with people you trust and then trust them. Uh, I say this because uh, it seems pretty obvious, but it's amazing how many startup founders will come to us and want to work with us. And then when we start working, uh, you can tell that they don't trust us to do what we do well. Um, and when I say that, one of the, the first indicators is when they come back to us with their first invoice and say, well, what does this mean and why did it take four hours? What does this mean and why did it take one hour? Um, here's the problem with that. Not that I have any problem explaining anything that we do, I don't. I love explaining it, especially when the question is coming from a place of curiosity and, and actual interest. Um, when it doesn't though, the problem is when you're building a company, you have a lot of things to worry about, like way more than any human should probably be worrying about in their lifetime. Um, you don't need to make potential distrust of your partner one of those things that can cripple your company. Um, 
So I usually tell people partnerships are like a marriage. You wouldn't just marry someone you just, well, okay. I don't want to be insensitive to certain cultures. I guess some cultures you do marry someone you just met, but usually you wouldn't marry someone you just met. Likewise, you shouldn't go into business with someone you just met. A lot of times founders will come to us and say, hey, here's our idea. Will you work for equity? No, because I just met you. Maybe we'll work for uh, as a contractor for a while because that provides an easy way for either one of us to break off the relationship and not have claim to each other's uh, ownership rights or anything like that. Um, but you know, we got to get to know you first, make sure we understand the vision and we have, that we can work well with you. So uh, treat a partnership like marriage. Work with people preferably that you, you've worked with or that someone you know has worked with um, because a lot of things will come to light during the, the um, process of working with someone on a company that you wouldn't have necessarily known before. In fact, I'm just gonna, I have a really interesting story, but in the sake of time, I'm gonna skip that one. I'm, I'm sure you guys probably understand this. Um, mind the equity split, but don't obsess over it. Again, I'm probably gonna kind of gloss over a few of the things that aren't as, uh, you know, go to market and sales strategy uh, as, as some of the other sites, because some of them really get into that a lot better. Um, but like I said, these are all just kind of random lessons. Mind the equity split, but don't obsess over it. Um, there are a lot of founders that we talk to who want to bring someone on. Maybe you're not big enough to just offer a straight up market rate salary to someone that you need. And so you use what you have. You, you can leverage the equity that you have in your company, which is the potential uh, that your company has to become more valuable than it is today is really what you're doing. You're selling someone on that idea. And so um, the problem is, uh, when you believe in it way more uh, than you can have someone else believe in it. This gets to um, you know the earlier point that everyone's selling something. When you're giving equity away to a partner, to an early founder, you're selling the vision of your business. Like I said before, no one's ever going to believe in it as much as you do because it's your idea, but hopefully you can get close. Um, the problem is when you go to someone and say, hey, do all this for no money and 1% of the company. That's probably not gonna work. You know, there has to be, it has to, there has to be give and take on both sides. Um, but I know a lot of founders who stress over the difference between giving away 23% of their company and giving away 25% of the company. The difference in those per two percentage points is probably less than the margin of error on what you're actually valuing your company at anyway. So I always say, mind it, plan for the future, plan for giving away more equity later, but don't obsess over it err on the side of generosity and move on with actually building your company. And you can also consider a dynamic equity system. There's a book called Slicing Pie that talks about that. So I won't go into detail on that, but if you're interested in that idea, check out Slicing Pie. It's literally like a two hour read. Um, and then get to work on your actual building uh, value. Um, I always tell founders, be in love with the problem, not the solution. This is where we start to get more into the marketing and sales aspect of building a company. This is. Um, when I say be in love with the problem, not the solution, what I mean is the solution is often going to change. When you're in love with the problem, or probably more accurately, I should say, be in love with the problem space, because sometimes you realize that the problem will change too. Um, but when you're in love with the solution, you tend not to actually be able to be receptive um, to other opportunities in that space. When someone tells you that what you're building isn't valuable to them, sometimes I've seen people argue that what they're building is valuable. You know what, if the person doesn't think it's valuable, either it's not valuable, which is probably pretty likely, or you're just really bad at explaining it to them in a way that they understand um, from their perspective. Um, but at any rate, I say, be in love with the problem instead of the solution, um, because the solution will change. You have to be receptive to other opportunities. You also have to know when to stay your path. You have to know when another opportunity is actually a distraction from your original value. So you also have to have kind of the vision and passion and perseverance to stay the path. Um, now, anyone who's you know really paying attention might recognize that those last two points are exact opposites and completely contradictory. And my answer to that is, Absolutely they are. Being an entrepreneur is hard. No one ever said it wasn't. Sometimes you'll get advice from one person that says do A, and then person B will say do B, where B is the opposite of A. You have to know which one to take. There's not always a right answer. And in fact, hindsight is typically the only difference between being a visionary and being a crazy stubborn person. Everyone talks about Steve Jobs and how great of an entrepreneur he was. I mean, the fact is if you really read through you know, the, the accounts of anyone who worked with him and how he worked, um, he could have just as easily failed because he was just notorious for not uh, receiving the feedback of others, of always being convinced that what he was doing was right. 
Um, now he happened, just so happened to be right very often, so it worked out well for him. Um, but I would argue that the only thing that makes Steve Jobs a visionary and someone else who operates exactly like Steve Jobs, a crazy stubborn person, is simply that Steve Jobs happened to succeed doing it. There's a lot of other people who don't. Um, so again, this kind of goes to my point of being an entrepreneur is hard. Um, there's not always a right answer. And usually the only way to know which answer is right is hindsight, which means you actually have to make a decision before you know which one's right. Um, customers are the only path to success. So I say this to founders all the time because usually we're coming in early stage. We're taking it from idea to first sale, to building a product and getting that first sale. Um, when you're a founder of a new company, you might absolutely know what the market is and you know what the pain points are and you know exactly what you need to build. Usually when I say to a founder, you know what you need to build, I put air quotes around the word no. You know what you need to build because uh, the best laid plans don't survive first contact with the customer. Um, so what I mean by that is um, imagine that building a company you're trying to get from where you are now idea to having a successful, sustainable, growing company. And between there, imagine it's a hedge maze that you have to walk through. Um, you don't know what the right path is. The problem with building a, a company from nothing is that the more appropriate metaphor is when you're walking through the hedge maze, you're blindfolded. And so imagine that each customer lets you lift the blindfold a little bit. So do you think you have a better chance of finding your way through the hedge maze if you try to make it halfway through and then take the blindfold off? Or if you actually start taking the blindfold off a little, little by little, like 10 steps into the maze. It's probably going to be little by little because you might not be able to see very well, but you'll be able to see something. And so I always say customers are the only path to success. Um, they're the only ones that can show you when you're wrong about what you know. Um, I tell founders, be wrong often, because a lot of founders have a problem with the idea that they, they know this industry inside and out, they see this opportunity, and they know it's an opportunity, and they get really uneasy if you even hint at the possibility that maybe they don't know that, or maybe what they know is incorrect, or, or ill-conceived, or wrong in some way. Um, but what I usually say to that is, you should actually revel in that, because if you know something, there's probably a lot of other people in that industry that also know those same things, which means what you know, knowledge, is not a very good barrier to entry for competition because a lot of people can know the same things that you know. What's a much better barrier to entry for competition is learning things by actually getting out there, talking to customers, watching them use your product. And this is why you want to release early and release often. This goes back to my hedge maze metaphor of lifting the veil a little by little as soon as you get uh, start walking into the maze. Um, learning is harder for other people to replicate. Other people can't build exactly what you built and then talk to the same people that you talk to and get the same feedback that you get. So you shouldn't be uneasy in the fact that what you know might be wrong. That should actually be awesome because by the time you find out it's wrong, that's a bigger barrier to entry for competition than what you knew before it. Um, work on stuff you like. This kind of gets into when you're selling something, you shouldn't be trying to do you know, competitive analysis, market competition, and sales uh, for something you don't actually know and believe in because you're not going to be able to effectively sell. Maybe you will, maybe you're an awesome salesperson that can sell ice to an Eskimo, but hopefully that's not, you know, maybe that's what you want to do. It's not what I want to do. Um, so I always say work on stuff you like. This actually goes back to, I told you I started Lead Nuke. Um, that actually came out of Rate My Student Rental. When I was building Rate My Student Rental, um, I found a, a repeatable strategy I could use to actually talk to the colleges and universities that I thought we had the best chance of making a sale to. And I built this software that automated the process of pinpointing which schools <coughs> had the uh, highest need for what we were building. And I actually abstracted that into a separate product called Lead Nuke for sales leads, um, basically generating warm sales leads. Uh, I started building the product. It worked really well for me. Um, I started getting a lot of customers, and I found that a lot of customers um, weren't using it in a way that I would like. There are a lot of people asking, you know, how can I use this to, to find people that I can pester and bug that don't necessarily need what I'm selling? And it got to be a real pain for me to even deal with the customers that were signing up and paying me for the product I had built. 
Um, so when I got an offer to actually, uh, from an angel investor, to get funding to grow Lead Nuke, uh, I thought really long and hard about it and realized that I would not enjoy taking their money and making this thing real, making it something I would have to sell every day. Um, so I actually turned them down and shut the company down simply because I did not enjoy running the company. Um, I think that it's really important to do this because when you're building a company or a startup, it, I mean, honestly, it's really hard. It's, it's not worth it. It's not fun. It's not worth it. There's, you're going to fail way more often than you succeed. Um, in order to actually persevere through the not fun parts and the hard parts, to get to the parts of success, you either have to be extremely passionate for what you're doing or you have to be extremely crazy. Um, either one of those will probably work. I've seen a lot of successful crazy people. So I'm not even saying you have to be passionate, but that's probably the one you have more control over. Uh, and like I said, you're going to fail way more times than you're going to succeed. In building some of the companies that I've built, um, if I was in it for the, the purpose of having a successful company at the end, I probably would have quit way before uh, I got to the point where those things started to be successful. Um, I worked, like I said earlier, I worked a lot on open source software where I would build software and give it away for free. Um, why did I do that? Well, to be honest, I, at the time I was building Alpha Django as a software consultancy. I actually rationalized it in my head as a marketing expense. I was probably spending 50% of my time working on software that I was giving away to everyone for free. Um, now, in reality, I did it because I really enjoyed watching people use and collaborate on the software that I had built. It was really awesome, just from, I guess, a personal ego building standpoint. That's probably the real reason I did it. But from a business standpoint, I rationalized the fact that I was spending 50% of my time on this as a marketing expense. Now, the funny thing is, now it's actually worked really well. Um, at Alpha Django, we do pretty well. You know, we've gotten to the point where um, we have uh, seven full-time people now. Um, we charge about one ninety five an hour, which is on the higher end in terms of hourly rate of what software consultancies generally charge. Why are we able to do that? Because that's what, well, for one, that's what we had to do to satisfy demand, but why is there that much demand for what we're doing? It's because of the years that I put in to building the brand on top of our open source software. Every time I release open source software, I branded it with Alpha Django. Um, like I said though, for the first year and a half, there was practically no return on that. It would have made no sense if I would have gotten a year in and said, this isn't making sense, it's not building any market value for my company, I should stop doing it. The truth is I was crazy passionate about it, I enjoyed doing it, so I kept doing it anyway. About two, two and a half years in is when it started uh, actually becoming a really viable marketing strategy for us in terms of the fact that now a lot of people hear about us all the time with CarCode actually, the other founder is based out of Seattle. He's told me on multiple occasions that he's gone to uh, startup events out of Seattle and talked to people and they go, oh, who's your technical uh, co-founder building this? And he goes, oh, I'm actually working with Alpha Django. And they go, oh, I've heard of them, they're pretty good. People in Seattle have just randomly heard of our seven person team because of all the stuff we did with open source and that we continue to do with open source. Um, on the surface, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It led to a lot of failures, but uh, it's actually worked now partly because we were passionate enough to believe in what we were doing and that's what kept us going through all the failures. Um, I would say create the executive summary and then throw it out. This kind of gets to you know um, the Benjamin Franklin quote, of uh, failing to plan is planning to fail. Um, create a plan, but when you're building a company and you're early on in the company, uh, a lot of your assumptions, everything you know in that plan is probably going to be uh, turn out to be wrong in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so I always say create it and then throw it out. It's important to go through the thought process. For one, it helps you come up with your uh, KPIs. Um, and then your KPIs, your key performance indicators, will end up showing you along the way how and why your assumptions are wrong, which should hopefully, you know, that's the learning process of them figuring out what are the new indicators, like maybe you need to change the ind indicator, or more likely you need to change what you're doing. Um, so creating your plan helps you, early on, helps you go through that. So think through your value proposition, um, create a realistic go-to-market strategy. Uh, I'll just say real quick here, if you're pitching to investors, do not say, hey, our market cap is $1 billion if we can get just 1%, eh, red flag. Uh, that's, that's a bad thing to say to investors. That it's immediately turns them off. 
Why? Because uh, it's, you may not realize it, but it's actually uh, intended to be a misleading uh, uh, way to show your go-to-market strategy. It's misleading because 1% sounds small, but the truth is 1% of a billion dollar market is crazy impossible to, to, to hit. Um, you have to believe that you can do it in order to have a chance at doing it, but even then, you have like a vanishingly small chance of actually doing it. So I always say, don't go the top-down method of saying, here's our market cap, if we can just get 1%, so how the hell are you gonna get 1%? That's the hard part. Um, what I say is, go from bottom up. Say, well, we're a three-person team. If we have one person dedicated to sales every single day, we've seen that he can actually uh, create five new leads a day. We tend to close 20% of our leads as an actual paying customer. Therefore, we can get five times 25, Five by five is five new customers a week. Um, at that rate, once we, we can grow to you know 20 new customers a month, which is 240 new customers a year, that's if we stay at three people. If we can do this, then in six months we can hire another salesperson, which will show our growth this way. It's not the top-down approach, it's the bottom-up approach. It's saying, given our current team, we can actually, we're on track to make $200,000 this year. If we grow along that path, then we can actually hire this many people, and next year we can be $500,000. Oh, and by the way, our market cap's $1 billion. That's right, I mean, just throw that as kind of a cherry on top at the very end of actually building your market strategy. Um, you know, planning your revenue, expenses, and profit, and understanding how much of that profit is going to go back into your company. If you actually have a growing and sustainable company that's scalable, um, scalable meaning uh, a dollar in usually equates to more than a dollar out, you're probably not gonna have much profit in the first few years, because if it's really scale scalable, it'd be dumb not to dump all your profits back into the company and make $1 turn into $2, which then turns into $4 and so on. Um, so plan all that out and get everyone on board you know, in the beginning. It helps you craft a better story if everyone's on board with what the actual uh, go-to-market strategy and plan is. Um, get users. So this goes back to you can create value, but in the end, one of the issues is if you, if you create value and don't realize the value, you don't have a company. Your value languishes. Um, it's not valuable unless someone's actually getting value from what you created. So that's where realizing value is important. Part of the problem with building a company is how do you know when you're creating value? The only way you know, like I said earlier, is from actual customers who will take that value and hopefully give you money for that value. That's the only way to know that you're creating value. Now, that's not an absolute statement. There's lots of ways to create value, such as like Twitter, that where I get value from having Twitter, but not nearly enough that I'm about to start paying Twitter. So they have to figure other things out. Um, so there, there's, of course, all these shades of gray, but the problem is, unless someone's actually getting value from what you're creating, you're only guessing that what you're creating is valuable. Um, so that's usually where a lot of the uncertainty comes in early on, is actually not knowing if what you're creating is valuable. When you talk to investors, when you try to bring on founders for equity, uh, you know, or even when you talk to customers, um, they might not be sure that what you're creating is valuable, even if you are. The only indicator that really shows them that what you're creating is value valuable is having people who are exchanging something with you for the value that you're creating. Um, when you go talk to an investor, they can think of a million reasons why your company won't work. Because there's already this person in the market doing exactly what you're doing and they're bigger than you and they'll crush you. Or because you have too long of a sales cycle to sustain yourself through when you can actually make the first sale. Or because what you're creating here actually costs more than what someone is willing to pay for. There's literally a million reasons why your company will fail. The one thing that shuts them all up is when you actually have users and paying customers. And I've seen this. An investor knows all. There's absolutely no way to convince them otherwise because they know more than you. And the only thing that shuts them up or will actually get them to say, okay, I'm wrong, please continue, is when you say, well, we're already creating, like we already have paying customers and it's already growing. That's the one thing that they can't argue with is what you're already doing. So that's why I always say, get users. Um, and again, users invalidate um, almost all of the reasons that they can come up with why your company won't work. Um, this slide is less of a lesson, uh, just kind of an observation. Startups sometimes fail for completely irrelevant reasons that have nothing to do with the actual uh, merit or value that they're creating and or realizing. Um, they fail for crazy reasons. They fail for political reasons. 
Um, I've actually seen more than one startup fail because one of the key founders uh, didn't get along with one of the key investors and they disagreed on where the company should go. And because they were constantly fighting each other, they were constantly undermining each other's initiatives. Um, and then the company goes out of business because they end up not getting anything done. Um, it's really unfortunate. I've probably seen more startups, uh, like more funded startups fail for this reason than any other. Um, they also fail um, for uh, like through, I said lawsuits, but really any, any legal uh, change or regulation. Um, I worked with one company that uh, they had actually grown to about 60 people, so you couldn't even call them a startup anymore. They were 60 full-time people, a pretty big company. Um, they did, uh, basically they did all sales, retail, and logistics for manufacturers, so they had an entire platform where a man, that allowed a manufacturer to easily sell their product to retailers across the world. Um, their business model was that the manufacturer would bring the product to them, they would get all the retailers on board, they would automate all the processes of warehousing, distribution, say online sales, all that kind of stuff. Um, when a retailer bought products, they would pay this company, this company would ship and do the distribution and all that, and then they would pay the manufacturer um, for that sale too. The regulations in their field actually changed one year where they weren't allowed to do that. Keep in mind they were international, so they had to uh, work within laws of not just the U.S. but elsewhere too, but they had some laws that changed that made them change the way that they collected money. Suddenly they weren't allowed to collect the money from retailers directly. The retailers had to pay the manufacturer and then the manufacturer had to pay them, which put about a 60-day uh, shift in their cash flow, a shift in the wrong direction, obviously. Um, a delay in their cash flow, and then within about a month and a half of that, the bank that underwrote their credit card processing merchant account uh, changed the terms of service of their account with them and said, if you don't keep at least a million dollars illiquid in your processing account at all times, we're gonna levy fees and hike up your rates. And that was within about a month and a half of their cash flow change, and they ended up having to have pay cuts across the board and some key people left, and within about a year and a half, they were completely out of business. Six, 60 person company, startup to 60 people to out of business. Um, had nothing to do with the actual value that they were providing to the retailers and the manufacturers. Um, arbitrary deadlines, one startup I worked with um, was actually doing pretty well. They had a lot of paying customers. They were growing steadily, um, but one of the milestones they had with one of their early investors was something like 25% quarter over quarter growth for the first couple of years. And I think they were doing more like 10 or 12% quarter over quarter growth, which if you really boil it down to my earlier two maxims of building a company, creating value and realizing value, they were doing both of those things. They had a valuable product that they were selling and their sales, their, their customer base was growing. They were just barely profitable, becoming more <coughs> profitable. Um, the investors weren't happy with the performance though, and because they didn't hit 25% one quarter, they actually exercised a clause where they took over the company, um, and the company's flailing now. The founders are gone, the development team is gone, and it's just like barely getting by, it's still kind of limping along. Again, nothing to do with the actual merit or the value that the company created or realized. Um, and also whims of fancy. There's a, a story recently about um, a, a startup that is really well known in this, the software startup world um, for being hugely successful. I think they're like 100 engineers now. Um, about a year ago, now this didn't kill them or anything because they're really big and they're a really awesome company, truth be told, so they, they rebounded from it. But uh, about a year or two ago, one of the original three founders' wives came in and was causing some sort of... Uh, uh, we'll call it scandals in the office place. And um, it ended up being this big to do. The founder was called out for enabling this sort of behavior. Um, the company ended up having to get rid of one of their original three founding members in a hundred person company because of this. And it probably severely hurt their prospects for you know further investment or future growth or that sort of thing, which they rebounded from. But the point being like, there's things that have nothing to do with what the company does that can have serious impacts. Um, so what's the lesson from this slide? I don't really know. Uh, <laughs> building a company can suck sometimes. Shit happens. I don't know. Something just, I guess, to be aware of. Um, 
solve problems iteratively, the best solution isn't always the technical solution. Um, I probably, I might not have to say this to you as much, I have to say this to a lot of developers who are building software startups. Um, going back to the, the example with Carco.me where we had talked early about it and we actually formed that initial partnership where we didn't have to build half the startup. That was really good for us. The best thing that we could do, the best experience for the end customer when we were first starting out was actually not building something that we were planning to build. Um, another example of this is actually within the same company. Uh, the founder came to me one time and said, hey, our importer that syncs our inventory with the dealer's inventory system runs once every 12 hours. Can we bump it up to once every six hours so that it runs four times a day instead of <coughs> twice a day? I said, well, we can. And if you'd asked a lot of other developers, they might have said, yeah, sure, it takes 10 minutes. Let me go ahead and do that. I'll change it on the server. Um, but instead of just doing that easy change, I, it seemed odd to me because I know the dealership space. I know the customer market. I know what their methods of delivery usually are uh, with their other software vendors. I know that twice a day is insanely frequent for a car dealership to have up-to-date information. They're used to having information that's updated weekly and all their other software uh, applications. And so I thought it was a really weird request to make. So I said, why in the world do you have a dealership asking for like four times a day syncing? And he goes, no. And then why do you want it? He goes, oh, because when we add a new dealer, it can be up to 12 hours until their inventory is imported the first time. And I want them to be able to see it working immediately. To which I said, oh, well, that makes complete sense. The problem is, one, if we make this change, it actually halves the runway of our current importing servers. We're going to have to double down on servers twice as fast as we are if we leave it at twice a day. It's going to incur more costs in the future. It potentially gets rid of a line item that we could charge extra for in the future because from what I know of the market, there's only a few dealerships who would want four times a day frequency syncing against the huge auto malls who would be more than happy to pay an extra thousand dollars a month for that ability. And if we provide this for all dealers that don't want it, we can't charge it extra for it for the big ones who need it. Um, and it, ha you know, it increases our costs. Um, not only that, but it doesn't actually solve the problem. When you sign up a new dealer, it'll still be up to six hours before their inventory is imported the first time. What if we keep it at twice a day, but we add a one-off job that imports it right away every time you add a new dealer? Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do that. So what was interesting here is that um, the, the easiest technical solution you could think of wasn't even the right thing. It was more of a process solution. Um, focus on the user or the customer. Perceive the benefit from them. Um, when we were building car code SMS, uh, a lot of our competitors had native mobile apps. And from a development standpoint, it's harder and takes more time to build native mobile applications than it does to build web-based applications that can just be accessed through your browser or on your phone or on your computer or anywhere. It's much easier to just make your web application adapt to the screen size than to build a different app for every different device. Um, a lot of our uh, competitors had native devices. If you ask any technical software developer, they always prefer native apps over web apps. So most of us who are building these types of solutions tend to get stuck in that mindset. Native apps are better than web apps. So let's build native apps if we can. Anything less is a compromise. Um, what was really funny about Carcode SMS is we actually avoided building a native app early on. Why? Because we knew our customer. We knew how they use products from when we had built carcode.me the first time. We knew what a dealership was like. We knew how the dealerships operated with their salespeople. We knew that if we had a native app, when we go to talk to a dealership, they say, oh great, I have to sign up. Then I have to train all my salespeople. Salespeople tend to have high turnover from dealer to dealer to dealer. So they're constantly having to retrain salespeople to download this app onto their phone and learn how to use it and keep the app up and open all the time. Um, so it was actually hurting our sales because uh, it would have hurt our sales if we had to sell them on a native app because in their minds, they hear native app and they think training. Now we built it to be mobile web. Why is that actually an advantage instead of a disadvantage like all of our competitors thought it was? Our competitors thought we were at a disadvantage because we didn't have a native app. We knew it was an advantage because everyone's smartphone already has a browser installed. If you text them a URL, they can click it. They have the app open on their phone right then and there. They don't have to go to the app store. They don't have to install an app. They don't have to register with an app and learn how to use it. You can literally text them a link that they click and you can walk them through the web app right then and there. They don't have to install anything, it's instant. Um, 
So that's actually how we built Car Code SMS, was not with a native app. We built it to send out notifications via text. So when a dealership signed up, all they had to do was enter the phone numbers of all their salespeople, and we took care of the rest. A salesperson didn't even have to know that the dealership had signed up to start using this product. Because what would happen is when the dealership received a text, we'd round robin assign it to the next salesperson. The salesperson would receive a text that says, you just got a new lead, click here to respond. Every dealership salesperson is going to click that link. They do not have to know where it came from, what this app is, why they're using it all of a sudden. You tell a dealer, a salesperson, here's a new lead, click here to respond, and they will click it. Um, and so that actually ended up being a huge uh, advantage to us because suddenly salespeople didn't even have to be aware of the app, much less need training. Um, so that's why it's important to see things from the user's perspective because when we get in, when we're building our companies, uh, I feel like the longer we build the companies, the less and less we have in common with the actual users who are not building our companies because we tend to gain more learning, all those things that provide a better competitive advantage, the more we learn from interacting with customers. Um, it's stuff that not only is it harder for our competitors to, to get the benefit of that learning, but our customers don't have it either, of course, because they're not going out and talking to other people necessarily. Um, so uh, it gets harder, the, the learning part that makes it easier and easier for you to actually uh, make the right decisions within your company may also make it harder and harder to actually empathize with your customers. So that's another thing to be aware of and to remember that you know your customer might not be as sophisticated as you are having dealt with a lot of customers. Um, this kind of goes back to my, uh, this is a little bit more detail about Lead Nuke. Um, remember I said with Rate My Student Rental, we were selling to colleges and universities. Now one of the hard parts about selling to colleges and universities is that it's a really long sales cycle. What we discovered is it was a 12 to 18 month sales cycle for one sale to a college or university in terms of getting on their approved vendor list. First, getting to talk to the right person. What we found out is not every university even had a right person to talk to. Uh, some universities had a housing department where they were only concerned about the dorms and did not care at all about the off-campus housing. They would say, why do we need to care about their off-campus housing? Of course, we could go in and start explaining to them, well, because it affects the perceived value that students have of their school, even if it's not managed by you, they still see it as an extension of your school. And if it affects their perceived value, then it affects the parents' perceived value. It affects their willingness and ability to continue through. Also, there's been studies that show that off-campus housing um, lead to more problems as landlords aren't really closely monitored or regulated, which can cause additional stresses for students, which means they're not focusing on their schoolwork. So there's a higher dropout rate in off-campus housing and you as a school, your students or your customers, it's cheaper to keep an existing customer than acquire a new one. We could go through this whole reason of why they should care about their off-campus housing, but it was hard. And if they didn't already know they need to be caring about it, they might not even have someone who works at the school who deals with off-campus housing. So like they didn't even have a right person to talk to. Suddenly we're trying to convince the school that they need to have a whole other department. And that was next to impossible. Um, so what we realized early on is some schools were more progressively thinking than others. Some schools actually had someone at the school whose entire job was to deal with off-campus housing. Some schools had already come to the conclusion that they had to build some product that helped them monitor uh, off-campus housing. If we could talk to those schools, suddenly we didn't have to convince them why they needed some platform to help them monitor their off-campus housing. We could just show them that Paying us a, a subscription fee is way cheaper than spending 50 grand that you had already budgeted on to build your own platform. And so um, that's actually where Lead New came from, is it's a software I developed that helped us uh, identify schools that were already having problems with their off-campus housing and trying to fix it by monitoring forums and Twitter and Facebook and all that kind of stuff. Um, so this actually gets back to the point, solutions don't sell themselves. It's not if you build it, they will come. That's bullshit, it doesn't work, it's lies. Um, you have to sell them. And selling is a two-step process. Step one is showing someone that they have the problem that you solve. And step two is showing them why your solution is the best solution versus something else. Step one is way harder than step two. If they don't already know that they have the problem, it's like 10 to 100 times harder than step two. So for a fledgling startup like we were with Rate My Studio Rental, we were bootstrap funded ourselves and we already had a 12 to 18 month sales cycle as it was, 
how much easier would it be for us if for now we just decided that our early adopters, our early target market, um, would be the schools that already knew they had a problem. So it's not that we're fixing the fact that we have to show some schools that they have a problem. We're just going to bypass it for now so that we can hopefully grow to the point that we would have the resources to go back and solve number one for the rest of the schools theater. Um, so that's, that's what we did there, and that's actually where Lead New came from um, in terms of uh, Rate My Student Rental. Um, I'll try to fly through some of the rest of these because we're getting close to the um, end of time. But, um, the only rules are your rules. Um, I tell people you need to know when to heed advice and when to ignore it because some people are going to tell you what you're doing doesn't make sense or here's why it won't work, here's one of the million reasons it won't work. You have to have passion enough to know that what you're doing is the right thing, but you also have to know when you're being boneheaded and you're just not seeing what everyone else is trying to show you. Again, the only real way to know the difference between the two is usually hindsight, um, but one of the things you can do is find ethical hacks that no one else has seen. This goes for selling and that sort of thing. Um, and I say ethical, hopefully, I would hope I don't need to say ethical, um, but uh, I've actually got a really funny example of you know an unethical one that, that was recent. There was a startup that was trying to get the attention of a really well-known investor. And um, if you're in a startup and you're trying to get the attention of investors, it's notoriously difficult. You pretty much always have to have an introduction. There's no such thing as just like, cold introducing yourself to an investor and having them give you the time of day. Um, so what they did to actually get an introduction to this investor is they figured if we can just get his attention, then we're in. And so they actually hacked his voicemail and they changed his voicemail message to say, hey, we're so-and-so startup. If you're calling this guy, uh, I think it was Jason Kalkanis was the investor. If you're calling Jason, please let him know that he should reach out to us and set up a meeting. Now, for one, that's extremely personally invasive and just outright stupid. Two, telephony hacking is a federal offense. And they just identified themselves in the message <clears throat> as the perpetrators of a federal offense. So I would say find legal hacks, but even that doesn't do it justice. Find ethical hacks. Don't, don't you know, obviously do unethical things. But uh, I'll give you an example, I guess, of an ethical hack. So with Car Code SMS, when we first started it, we had actually identified Edmonds as being a perfect partner for us. Potentially an, uh, an acquirer or investor, but what we were really going for is trying to license our software to Edmonds to resell to their dealerships. So we thought, how can we get, a, get the attention of Edmonds and other companies like Edmonds, maybe Cars.com or Autotrader or someone like that? Well, within the first couple of weeks that we had started building it, we actually heard about this uh, hackathon that Edmonds was putting on, was organizing called Hackamotive, and it was only the second year that they had ever done it. This was back in January of 2014, this past year, that we heard about this. How did we hear about it? Someone tweeted it to us because we had been openly talking about what we were building, again, going back to that first slide. So someone tweeted to us, hey, heard about what you're building, you should check out Hack of this Hackamotive competition and try to enter it, you'd be perfect. We looked at it and thought, one, we would be perfect. Two, Edmonds is perfect for us. And we looked into the details of the competition and realized that not only were they hosting it, but they were host hosting it in their headquarters building in Santa Monica, California. Suddenly an idea. What if we use the Hackamotive competition as our Trojan horse? We enter the competition. They actually invite us out to Santa Monica for four days and invite us to come work out of their headquarter building for three days. So we did. The trick is we had multiple people, we had four of us that were at the competition. Um, we decided what if three of us actually worked on the competition uh, tasks on any given day and the fourth of us snuck away to the fifth floor and dropped in on the executive offices to try to set up some meetings. So we did. Um, and actually, by the fourth day, when they uh, went to announce the winners of the Hackamotive, we already had three meetings set up for that week with uh, VPs and directors at Edmonds in the departments that they would need to uh, integrate with us for. And so we already, and by that time, we didn't even care about the outcome of the Hackamotive competition. We were ready to finish dead last and be totally happy with it because we had already set up three key meetings that we needed with our target partner. Um, 
Now, the funny thing is we actually ended up winning the competition also. So we, uh, thank you. Um, they gave us a big phone check for $20,000, but we already had three meetings. And the cool thing is once we won, those three uh, um, executives at Edmonds were actually much more happier that they had already set up meetings with us. And so they were already invested in our company before we even won their competition. That just you know further solidified the relationship. So then they actually ended up starting a new accelerator program this summer, the first one ever, and we were one of three companies invited to come out, uh, out to that. So we did their accelerator program, worked through that. At the end of it, we basically said, hey, we want to partner with you. What's it going to take? They said, what if we just buy you? We said, haha, that's funny, but seriously, it's a partner. And they go, no, seriously, we want to buy you. And then that's how we ended up getting acquired in October. Um, but that's an example of, you know, it's an, it's an ethical hack. We figured out that we could actually get these meetings with people at their workplace when they're already planning to do work and in the right mindset during the week that they were doing Hackamotive. So they had rallied the whole company behind these startups that they're, you know, bringing into the company and being innovative with. And so it was the perfect opportunity for us. We were probably, there were 12 uh, companies in the Hackamotive competition, mm -hmm. and we were the only ones that were sneaking away to set up meetings during the competition. Um, and this is one of the last main points I have. Uh, this is one of the hardest points usually to explain to founders, uh, especially when you're developing your go-to-market strategy and figuring out your sales process, is that your target market changes over the course of your company. So as if it's not hard enough already to correctly identify your target market, create a cohort from that target market, decide what the best way is to actually reach that target market in an effective manner that you can, um, actually let me step back for a second because that's a good point too. Uh, when I'm helping startups at like Startup Weekend, a lot of times people wanna create these products that do these really general things. One time I worked with a startup, they said, we wanna create an app that helps you follow through with changing your habits. I said, okay, what does that mean? And they're like, well, you know, like, you don't exercise and you want to exercise, so it'll help you start exercising. Or you smoke and you want to quit smoking, it'll help you quit smoking. I said, okay, I, I can kind of see where you're going. The problem is, who's your target market? They go, everyone. I said, okay, how can you possibly reach your target market then? It's impossible to reach everyone. Even something like Facebook, which arguably now has a target market of everyone, did not start out with a target market of everyone. It started out with a target market of Harvard. Why? Because they, he was a Harvard student and he needed it and he knew how to reach other Harvard students. You start out with a target market you can actually attack. This goes back also to the bottom-up planning. You have to actually have a game plan for how to go to market. So, you know, you're setting yourself up for failure if you identify your target market too broadly because it's impossible to effectively go to market on a broad target market. One of the questions I usually ask people, it's getting more and more dated as years go on, so it becomes less and less uh, easy to understand. But one of the questions I ask them is, if you were to buy a full page ad in a magazine, which magazine would it be? Hopefully you have an answer for that, and hopefully the answer isn't like, people, or something like that. Um, so for them, I said, what magazine would you take out an ad in? <clears throat> All of them? Yeah, good luck with that. So um, what they ended up doing, they actually came to a breaking point. This is a startup weekend is 48 hours. Saturday evening at five o'clock, one of them came to me and said, hey, we have a situation, can you come help us out? I said, okay, sure, I followed them back to the conference room. They have people in coats with their bags packed, ready to leave. They said, so our problem is we can't agree on how we should actually build this app for everyone. And it's gotten so heated that everyone's just ready to quit and go home. And like one person was on their way out the door when I walked in and said, hey, come in for a second, like don't leave yet. And so we sat down and I talked through, through this with them. And this is when I said, you know, what magazine would you take out and add? And if you can't identify one, let's refocus your market. I'm not saying you can't eventually build an app for everyone. Great, put down your plans for that into a Word doc, save it and close it. Now, what are we building today? And so for them, I just said, okay, What's a good habit that a lot of people can empathize with that's easy to break? And we ran around the table and everyone threw out a habit. And after everyone on the team, it was about eight people had thrown out a habit, I said, okay, which is everyone's favorites? And everyone voted on one of two habits and ended up going with start exercise. And they actually ended up coming with, up with an idea. They couldn't even figure out, they couldn't get the technical people to figure out what they needed to build. Like how in the world, like what does an interface look like for an app that helps you change habits? I don't know. 
it's a to-do list, it's a reminder, it's a whatever it is, I don't know. They actually came up when they focused on let's just make something that helps people who don't exercise start exercising. And I said, okay, what's an innovative way you can do it that's novel and unique and would be kind of fun to do? They actually, within uh, 10 minutes, they came up with the idea of creating an app that you install on your phone and it will randomly ping you throughout the day with a random exercise that you can do anywhere. So it'd be you know, squat thrust or something like that. And you had 60 seconds to complete that exercise when it pinged you. It actually ended up being a really fun app. They actually ended up being able to craft a business model around this by licensing out to companies like P90X, where you could get the app for free and then you could buy the P90X pack, which was all P90X based exercises, or you could buy Zumba pack, which is all Zumba exercises and stuff like that. They actually create a viable uh, uh, idea for a business um, uh, plan or a business model. And before the end of the weekend, they had actually already reached out to, uh, this was in Toledo, they reached out to the University of Toledo and already started conversations with their health department to officially uh, create a partnership with them so that the health department at uh, University of Toledo would provide it for free to all of their students. And so they went from almost having everyone walk out the door halfway through the competition on Saturday evening to actually winning first place in the entire startup weekend on Sunday evening. So again, it's about focus because if you can't attack your market, not just attack it, but attack it effectively, even if they had answered the question of what magazine they'd publish in, I would say, great, what message could you possibly craft that would convince everyone? You can, you don't have the resources. Even Facebook, which is arguably now for everyone, is different things to different people. My mom uses Facebook for a different reason than I do. And I use it for a different reason than my younger brother does. And he uses it for a different reason than my grandparents do. Even Facebook doesn't have one message that they can craft that would be compelling to everyone. So even they can't take out an ad in a general purpose magazine. They have to take out many different ads with many different messages to many different markets. And that's something you can't even afford to do until you're big enough to do it. So um, that's why it's important to know that your target market changes. Uh, it changes when you're an idea trying to build your MVP. It changes when you're an MVP or your minimum viable product trying to go to the next step. And it changes when you actually find your viable, sustainable business model and want to grow it. Um, and it you know, changes as you iterate and when you start raising funding. Um, when you're building an idea that you want to create a sustainable and growing business, you can't just go from idea to sustainable and growing business. There's lots of steps between you. So usually the, in the startup world, there's a minimum viable product somewhere in this path. And so when you're building your MVP, your customer base isn't these people. It's actually your early adopters. And even before that, you gotta find the people who can help you build it. So your target market that you're selling to at that first stage is selling your idea to other people who will help you build the product. So your target market actually goes from partners are your target market that you're trying to sell to. You're trying to sell yourself and your idea to get partners to help you build a minimum viable product, which you're then trying to sell that to your early adopters. And when you actually find something sustainable that people will give you money for, meaning you've probably iterated a bunch here to find the value that you actually know is value because people will give you something to use it, um, then you have to figure out how to grow from your early adopters so you expand your market. So your target market changes, which means your message most likely changes from stage to stage. It actually gets even more confusing when you're trying to seek investment because sometimes your idea is so big there's no way to actually build it on your own. It's gonna require a lot of upfront capital. And so there's no way to go from idea to this big idea you have, there's a wall between it. And the only way around the wall is to get early investment from let's say an angel investor or a venture capital uh, fund or friends and family or something like that. Um, now in the software world, it used to be that you get a really good idea, pitch it to investors, and then they'd give you money to build your minimum viable product and grow from there. That doesn't work anymore. There's way too many people building products. Cost of software has changed, so this might not be directly applicable to you if you're not building software, but it probably still has some truth that you often can't get investment for just an idea this day and age. There's too many people trying to do it. So um, what actually happens now is you have to build your minimum viable product and start getting some traction just to get the interest of investors. So what's really key here is recognizing that when this is your path, your target market is not these people. If you're building software for Dow Chemical to use, your initial target market actually is not Dow Chemical. Your initial target market is the investors who are going to fund the product to help you grow and to gain the introductions of the people you need at Dow Chemical and to actually sell it to them. So 
Now, the good news is a lot of times it just so happens that investors like traction, and traction can usually be shown by having early adopters, which are some subset of your market. So it just so happens early on that a lot of times you are building this product for these people, but it's an indirect relationship. You're not building it for these people because these people find it valuable. You're building it for these people because when the investors are trying to figure out if it's valuable, they're looking to these people. But it's an indirect relationship and it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes investors have different incentives. This is why you know it's important early on to know what the difference is, like who you're getting in bed with for your company. Because eventually your investors are not going to be satisfied just with having happy customers. They're gonna to wanna to see some more profit or distributions or some sort of acquisition or something like that that doesn't necessarily have to do with the value you're creating for the customer. At some point, there's a difference between the value you're for creating for the customer and the value you're creating for investors. So that's why it's important to know when it's different incentives, when you have a different target market. Even if your target markets seem like they align, they won't always, and your target market changes. So when you're here, your target market is these people. When you get their investment, then your target market is these people. So your message changes and your go-to-market strategy changes because your market changed. So like I said, my kind of maxims are create value, realize value. There's a third one, be lucky. <laughs> that one's actually probably more important than the first two combined. The problem is I just don't know how to do that necessarily, so I didn't create a presentation on be lucky. Um, so yeah, let's see if, thank you. <laughs>